So those of you that don't know me, I'm Naomi. I help to run Entrepreneurs for the Future, or Everworkers, the kids call it. Um, that is our tech incubator, incubator that is run by Innovation Development Week. So if you are a tech starter and you're looking for mentorship, similar to where community full of other tech startups, come and talk to me after and I'll tell you all about the programs. Three to six months application uh, process. And I can, I can tell you anything else after that. Um, it's quite an innovation but we also offer membership. And for your membership, you get use of hot desking, free parking, free Wi Fi, <coughs> free meeting room. Uh, we want a host of events. This is our biggest event, but we also have workshops every day. We have um, visiting experts coming in, talking to you, telling them, telling you, like, don't do this, I do that, don't do it, or make sure you do this in your business. Um, we have a lot of things going on, at least one, two a month, something like that. Um, again, come talk to me if you're interested in membership. Um, is there anybody here who's not been here before? Ah, that's quite good. Come on, welcome, welcome. Um, the kind of setup of this evening is going to have a few talks, um, and then after each talk, we'll have a bit of QA. Um, and then in between the talks, I'm going to give opportunities for people to just give a one minute pitch about themselves. So you can make use of the networking afterwards. So you have to think about if you want to do that, it's best for job. You need to go one minute to kind of say this time, come talk to me. Um, before we get on with the actual very exciting talks, I want to introduce Hugo Russell. He's also very exciting, I'm sure. <laughs> 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 He's going to explain the right mode to us. Thank you. Right. Um, something the South Park have recently taken on as we went through a bidding process franchise application, a thing called the Open Data Institute. Um, those who run businesses purely driven on external data, they're starting to become a bigger service. And what Science Park's done is starting to work with the community that's happening in Birmingham. Now, give you an idea of the amount of data that's out there and things. This is a joined up of the amount of linked data sets that were available several years ago. What this means is through the use of APIs, you guys can actually add functionality, services, features to your offering. It adds value and makes it more difficult for others to enter the market. The reason we actually go ahead and doing this is we were approached by a number of organizations, specifically the West Midlands Open Data Forum, who are actually just finishing off a meeting at the moment. These guys are like the fire service, the hospitals, people who are looking at getting information out there for us to commercialize against and take opportunities. If you're looking down at headquarters, you can come and have a chat about this later, but you've got to be one from Rackspace, one of the largest hosting companies, Virgin Media and others. Um, if I said to Sir Tim Berners-Lee, I'm assuming you're all aware that he created HTML, which people, at the moment, people would call it the internet. Um, so, um, if I said to uh, Professor Sir Nigel Shadbolt, most of you probably... Does anyone know of Nigel Shadbolt? Wow. Um, Big data, if I said that, there's the guru, the man behind it all. He and Tim Berners-Lee created the Open Data Institute as a way of building standards and ways of large organizations and companies that be able to put the data out there for people to then engage with. So Transport for London in the tube, um, they didn't build most of that stuff. It was developed by external people using their data just to give you an idea of what's capable. Anyway, what's it mean for us is that Birmingham, particularly the council, have even gone and published data. So, if you wanted to, they don't do anything with transport. Right, don't need to worry about that. Health, <laughs> the schools, cycling, and there's a plethora of other sources of data out there that you can actually <coughs> enter and draw from to add extra functionality to what you guys are doing. Um, to give you an idea, Guess where all the money is in the country? And it's showing you London there. So you can do some very innovative ways of mapping, 
through to our open corporates. Um, anyone doing anything with finance data or even to anything around directors, worthwhile having a look about yourselves, because all of, the, all of you who have your own business will be in open corporates. So if you've ever heard of Judo, anyone heard of Judo? Okay. The company's house, I hope most of you have done. <laughs> this does the world, including the UK. So open corporates is where we're going to have a look. The opportunities for you, very quickly, there's no networking that happens around within focused workshops, which, like me, we were saying, ties into helping you guys make access to things, training, and additional startup opportunities. If you are using open data, we can help you take stuff global through this as well, and on various projects. Uh, one thing to bear in mind, on the training here, we've got a training course, but plus we've actually got some 30 um, heavily subsidised memberships to the ODI, which we can give away to those who are genuine about it. Heavily subsidised means if you butter us up and can demonstrate that you really do know what you're talking about, you have it for free. And if you're around at lunch times on Fridays, we do a streaming or once a fortnight on activities there. They're the people you've got a matter with, say Hassel Mo or Paul or Andrew or Ted, and that's a service that the Science Park have added in for you guys and the wider community. It is the ODI node for Birmingham. We're driving it, but if you, if you or others know <coughs> wants to benefit in it, feel free to give us a hassle. Will you? I should have said, for those of you who are here, we've got a live Twitter follow going on here, so if you're on at Tech Wednesday, at Entrepreneurs for F, hashtag Tech Wednesday, you can give us a little shout out on there. Um, first up is Matt from Borough Club. Matt has just graduated from E for F, so congratulations to Matt. Uh, <laughs> and when we do the Q and A afterwards, please do wait for the microphone so that the whole room can hear you. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, Mike. Yeah. Yeah. Super. Good. Hi, my name's, my name's Matt, and I am the founder of Borough Club. Uh, Borough Club is an online website where people can share their household items with other people within their community. So you're able to access the site and upload stuff that you need to share with other people that are around you. Uh, and of course you can buy stuff from people locally to you as well. Um, and my mission this evening, uh, my long term mission is first of all to you guys sharing your stuff. Long term, I'd like to see Barney doing that as well. Uh, in a whole host of reasons, um, maybe because a lot of individuals start training their stuff, but also maybe schools and councils and those types of areas as well. So um, please pay attention and start sharing, please. Um, we see ourselves as the middle ground between eBay and Throwaway. So <coughs> in eBay, you've got something you no longer need it anymore, so you need to say it's really good some money. Uh, with Throwaway, you recycling, it no longer works, so you need to recycle that item and get rid of it. We want to capture the stuff that you have lying around your home that you don't get rid of because you are going to use it again, but it's something that you don't use that often. And by using uh, and interacting with that platform, you are going to earn some money from items that you post on the site that people borrow from you. Uh, and meanwhile, of course, if you're borrowing something, you're sending a whole bunch of cash. Uh, it's going to add much sales and you're going to use once in a while. And of course, we're doing great stuff because we're connecting the community, because people are meeting new people, having a cup of tea together most of the time as well, and we send a whole bunch of CO2 because we're reusing stuff that we've already got and saving the manufacture of some new items. Now, what I'm thinking is this for me. Um, well, I've got a few examples here, but it might be suitable for you. So, are you know, all startups in the room with your hand up, or people are thinking of doing a startup? Fantastic. So, if you're a startup, you can actually earn some money because we often go, I know this from personal experience, those luxuries in life. And what you can do actually by using the service is earn a little bit of extra money to go out and treat yourself every now and then. So that's very useful. One startup has even showcased their products on our site and able to get market testing using our service as well. And if you want to donate to a charity, I'll talk more about that in a moment, but we've also got a charity for our function as well. Or if you're trying something new, such as a musical instrument, we're going to be camping for the first time. Don't go and buy the thing. You can buy it from all of our members, test it in the real world, and decide if you like it. And then if you don't, you haven't wasted all that money. 
Uh, and of course, if you've got storage issues, you might be able to house that bulky item so you can gain access to the mobility also. And if you've got some debt, which probably most of the startups might have, I don't know. Uh, but if you have some debt, it's a good way to erode your debt and stop yourself getting into more debt. And the reason is, uh, I read this stat actually last week, that the Office for National Statistics said that the average UK household is about £12,000 in debt, which accounts for 26.5% of their annual income. So with that in mind, I was thinking, how have they got into so much debt? And it's probably because you're going and buying stuff that you're rarely using that often. And so this is where our solution can potentially help you. So for me to life, you've got a picture of a drill and a poem. I don't need to focus on the mental, I just focus on the whole. You've got a job to do, so this weekend, and that job, for this example, is going to be putting up a shelf. All you need is a bunch of holes. You don't need to go out and buy a drill, but you, need, you do do that. Uh, before something like Bar Club or uh, came on in. So you go to the local retail store, purchase a drawer for 30, 50, 100 pounds, and draw holes, put the shelf up, and then you put the drawer somewhere in the home, the garage, I say, and it stays there for the rest of the year. What you want is a bunch of holes. What if you can access that locally to you for a fraction of the price, roughly about 10 cents of the price, and still achieve the same result? And that's what we're able to do. And the reason why we've got the hashtag 12 minutes is because the average drill is only used for 12 minutes a year. So we're going to have to spend £100 on that type of item. And just think about other items that you've got that you can purchase that uh, don't get used that often as well. So how does it work? You can sign it for free. You can post your items for free. What we ask for is that you put a, a loan value against it uh, that you're looking to achieve from the item, as well as a security deposit. And then when the borrower pops along, they choose the item that they're looking to borrow, for however many days they're looking to borrow, and we deal with all the money. So all the money gets paid to us. We have our fee that we charge the borrower as well. And then we can either collect and deliver on your behalf, or we which rather you go and collect the item because it's about building the community as well. Once the transaction is finished with, we will then send an email to the owner of the item to say, has everything gone okay? Has your item been returned in the original condition? And if they confirm yes, we'll refund the security deposit back to them and also pay the loan fees to the owner of the item. That's how it works, it's really simple. And this is actually some of the stuff that we've got on the site today. The original idea came to me in my garage, we've got some garage items, but now we're in people's wardrobes, kitchens, sheds, all over the place. And so you've got go on there, even a candy flash machine if you were going for a So those are the types of things that we've got that you can make uh, more use of. We work like in a hope work environment. So to make this business model really work and flourish, it needs a borrower, it needs a lender, the are local to each other. And what I mean by that is there needs to be a maximum two or maybe three mile radius, preferably a mile radius. So you're dealing with people that are local to you. So we're doing active work in postcards within the Miami region, where we've launched it, in schools, so we're working with a few schools as well, and they're even now starting to load their own items onto the site because they realise they've got tons of idle items. We're also doing work with universities as well. And I'm very keen to work with office environment and what better place than Innovation Birmingham, which is another high quality environment. So you all live separately in different places, but you all convene on this place every day. And that'd be a great place to exchange items as well. So it'd be fantastic to get into Innovation Birmingham and other offices as well. But it's just one problem. The question of trust. Because you don't trust me because I'm going to nick your item and I don't trust you as part of my time there. Uh, because you're going to damage my item. Well, I think we would argue that because we've got measures in place about the security deposit, we've gone some way to eliminate that trust. But what we've actually learned from the people who have used the service, they actually fed back and said that they treat the item with more respect than if they had borrowed it from a friend or family. So they treat them out of strangers' items with more respect and care than actually their own friends and family. But to further uh, develop the trust uh, argument, I would argue back to you guys, who, could, who can you trust nowadays? Obviously, the banks have not had a very good time with it. So these large corporations that are giving you incorrect data about the, the stock that they've got and the products they're selling you, or even people paying the taxes where they should be paying their taxes, or maybe the sporting organisations acting in a sporting manner. Because if you remember my previous slide about the hyper local marketplace that we've got, you've chosen to live at some place because of the privacy probably, but also the community that surrounds you. So the only way to be only people you can trust are the people that are close to you within your own community. So I wouldn't worry about the trusting. People are loving that site. Very much people most of them. 
And this is the way it seems that this is something we're doing for the charity as well. So the lady in the bottom left is a lady called Lorraine, and she is the fundraising manager for AGK. Now she has an item, the pink gazebo, that she uses for her events, but she doesn't use it that often, only about two or three times a year. And she's spent about £100 on that item. So she's kindly put that on the board club. Meanwhile, there's a lady on the top right called Linda, who wants to get access to this item, to that item, to host the baby shower for the lady on the bottom right. Who was having a baby? Can you guess the sex of the woman? Yeah. It was a girl? Yes, it was a boy. No, it was a girl. So she needed to gain access to something for this one time event. So she was able to borrow that gazebo for just one day for £10. And the great thing was, she did that on a budget, her friend had a great day, and more importantly, or just as importantly, that money went straight to age UK. Um, so we went to have a good course, and that's what we're doing as well. We're helping good courses and charities through these types of things. <coughs> and from a personal perspective, our best owner of items last year made 70 pounds in the space of just three weeks from lending out four items. And this is what can happen. And from lending out those four items, that person actually paid for one of the items that we lent out uh, through just receiving our income coming through to them. Meanwhile, another family actually uh, saved 400 pounds because they borrowed a roof box and a gazebo, a not gazebo, a roof box and a cool box to go on a trip to France. And they actually saved so much money they were able to pay for the whole front. So again, those are some examples. So I'd be very grateful if you could sign up today. You can follow borrowclub.co.uk, scroll all the way down to the bottom, and you can sign up there, or you can follow the QR code as well. But thank you very much for your time, and please share your stuff, and in the future don't buy it by Thank you. Okay. Oh, very, very interesting. Uh, have we got any questions for Matt? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Hi, Matt. Uh, good question. Thank you. Hello. Uh, Hello. Uh, Hello. Uh, Hello. Uh, Hello. 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 When you move the tenants uh, register on your site to verify they are who they say they are, and they look at the address they say they're borrowing from. Yeah. Thank you. Nice, no, good question. Um, so the process that you've got, you, when you sign up, you just sign up and you don't give us any details really, apart from just a few basic details to us. When you want to start getting more involved in the service, when you want to borrow something or you want to learn something, you can actually then, what we ask you then to do is give us all of your details, so your name, your address, your telephone number, as well as your PayPal details. Then when a transaction happens, we verify that against the PayPal details address that's on there as well. There are software patches out there which will allow you to go a lot deeper than that, even look at credit checks and so on and so on. It's a bit upsetting for us at the moment. Maybe in the future we'll have some more ideas that we can bring those to the fore as well. But that's the kind of measures that we're going to place at the moment. Okay, let's have to judge. Well, yep. um, I was just wondering how long it, it takes uh, for someone that's given someone to get paid. Um, is there something where they get paid immediately or do they get the um, thing back to them? Or? Yeah, um, I wouldn't put in the owner of the item straight away. But then I thought, what if the borrower collected it and the thing just wasn't working and they got it back to their place? Um, so what we do, we hold on to all of the money until the uh, transaction is completed. Then when it's completed, the owner of the item will get that email to say, is anything going okay? Of course the borrower, if they encounter a problem, the item could allow it us to straight away as well, of course. Um, and then after that point, we don't really sort of funds to everybody. So that everybody in the whole transaction is happy with what's, uh, what's happening. Um, I have a lot of disputes when people would say, is it not in working condition, or is that better when you give it to me, or yeah. is it too important? Number one, that has happened, yes, so touch wood. Um, but if I know that, that, yes, but I'm not sure something will happen. Um, the thing that does happen, because we've got the security deposit now all the way it, if there ever was a dispute, then we get in touch with the owner of the item first to understand the situation. And equally get in touch with the borrower as well to find out what the situation is really in. But what we also do is we look at the asset itself. Because if the item that they've lent was already so many years old, is it just natural failure of the item as well? So that's when we get involved. And at that point, we then get the intermediary to say, well, maybe the owner of the item can keep all of the security deposit, or 
number of houses to the deposit. Do you have, in your terms and conditions, some sort of dispute process that basically people go through, or...? Uh, it's basically Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 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 Yeah, um, how do you look to overcome potential issues around sort of location? So, the site is volume to be able to register today. Yeah. And then, you know, if there's no ideas, there's no one else registered. Is it just a case of because you're still new, that's, that's going to develop? Or is that a long term problem, maybe? I don't know. Uh, it's, it is a problem. Yeah, it's a really good problem. Uh, not a good problem, but it is a problem, I suppose. Uh, because I'm really marked in this in the Bible region, we're doing really well in this region. I'm trying to connect a few dots up together. I was in the Sunday Times a couple of weekends ago, and that was great. Uh, but the, one of the issues with that is that I've got people listed now in Scotland, in London, in London, not in London, all over the country. And they're just little individual islands that are just sitting there waiting for their areas to be activated. And um, I've taken a few things to get those areas activated. Made, but one of the key things I've found is that we actually need to be involved in the community and go out and promote this to local community groups or schools or whatever. Or so it's almost like replicating me potentially to do that, as well as my staff members who I can give to them as well. But it is a challenge, yeah, it's a very good point. I think we've got one more. Yeah, we've got one more. Yeah, we've got one more. How many sorry, sorry, we just got oh. someone at the back there. Oh, sorry. Um, I just wanted to sort of ask, um, have you considered um, reviewing, or um, in terms of um, users reviewing one another, is that a step to follow? Um, no, it's not. Um, we've got uh, an experience review within the actual site as well. So, shortly after you borrow something, uh, an email will go to the person that's actually borrowed it to review not only the item, but also the personal notes as well. So that's the big feedback, which will then obviously help other members that want to buy or something or that's how it's in what the response was like and you know, get some knowledge from that so they don't know if you're right. Absolutely. I was just going to ask how many borrowers have you had in your first year of trading? Uh, it's been, uh, we've had about 25 borrowers so far. What's disappointing is I've missed out on more than a couple of those because I'm frequently contacted by people to say, have you got a whatever it might be? And of course, we've missed you out through our network and uh, social media as well. Uh, and we've missed out on at least 25, if not a bit more, followers. And that goes back to the chap in the picture over there, really activating certain areas and making sure there's a right stock of items in certain areas as well. <coughs> Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Okay, uh, next up is Steve Hayes, which is Benito. You want to come up? Uh, get yourself ready. So, is anybody going to do their one minute pitch? Anyone? 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 Cool. Straight over to the next one. Perfect. Hang on. My name is Steve Hayes. I'm the uh, technical director at a uh, digital agency called Studio Benito. We're based uh, here at Faraday Wharf. Um, we've been here about five and a half years, and we really like it to help plug them. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about uh, bad workers always blame their tools, um, which is a phrase you've probably heard, um, but it's maybe a bit old. Does this click or work? Oh, there we go. So I was doing some research for this talk and I came across this quote from an 18th century uh, American poet and philosopher, not that I particularly read that stuff. Um, it's called Henry David Th uh, Thoreau. And it says this, Lo, which I just think is a great way to start any quote. Uh, Lo, men have become the tools of their tools. And I don't know if I'm going to commit uh, literacy heresy here by taking this completely out of context. But when I read that, I thought, man, I really am a tool for tools. <laughs> I am mean, what some people uh, would call a magpie. I see the latest cool thing on Happy News or on Twitter or wherever, and I'm like, this is amazing. We need to use this. This is the best thing ever. And um, over the years of running this agency, I've realized that's actually not the best way to be. What we've learned um, as a team and what I've learned individually is that these tools that are available to us 
are great. Uh, there's nothing wrong with tools, but it's all about how you use these tools that's important. You need to make tools work for you. Uh, and that's a massively important thing that we've learned uh, throughout this process. So what, how do you go about, how do you go about, you see a cool tool, you see something, you're like, oh, that could work for us. How do you go about making that work for you? Well, I would argue that what we need to do that is a process. So I did what all good millennials did do, and I, uh, I went to Google and I typed in define process. And uh, this is what came up. A process is the action or actions you take to fulfill a task. So an example of this is you go to your uh, favourite Swedish furniture shop and you buy a wardrobe and you get it home and you unpack it and you've got all of these great things in front of you. You've got hardboard, you've got these cool little rails, you've got screws, you've got allen keys, they love their allen keys. And maybe you're the kind of guy uh, or girl who tries to put this together on their own. I've tried that and failed miserably. Uh, and so I'm the kind of person that needs the instruction manual. And so I'd have a look at this manual and I'd go through it and it's, look at these little pictures and we all know who's, anybody who's used like here is that these pictures are just really difficult to actually understand. Uh, that's a different talk altogether. Uh, and what this instruction manual is, is it's a pictorial process for how to put this, to use these tools to create what you're wanting to get. And what you're wanting to get is a wardrobe. Um, and you can follow this process to get that. And I think that is really important for business. Uh, as most of you business owners know, uh, a lot of business is just common sense applied. And uh, if I'm teaching you to suck eggs, then uh, I apologize. But I think that this is something that it took me probably three and a half, four years to actually wrap my head around properly. So I wanted to give you some examples of how we created processes um, within our company to use these tools. Uh, so the first one, this was actually, this example happened a, uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we wanted to start doing staff reviews. We think that's a really important thing. Um, and I kind of handle that kind of side of the business. And so I was tasked with that. And so what I did is I jumped in and looked at all of the cool stuff that's available. So I looked at Google's OKRs. I looked at PayPal's PVPs, I looked at Smart Goals and all that kind of stuff. And I thought, hold up Steve, you're going to talk at Tech Wednesday in a couple of weeks about this. You probably need to actually practice what you preach. Um, and so I, I started and I took a, a step back. And I don't know if anyone has seen the um, TED talk by Simon Sinek um, about why, how, what. If you haven't, it's probably one of the best TED talks that they've ever done. Um, and it's... Um, I'll, I'll tweet out a link later for it for anyone who hasn't seen it. And he's written a book which I haven't read, but it's on the wish list. Um, and he talks about uh, it's probably blog talent, and that's that's fine, right? Um, he talks about why, how, what. So you start with the why. So with our um, wanting to do staff reviews, I was like, okay, so why do we want to do that? What's our fundamental belief for this? And it's when we our belief is that when the team is thriving, Benito will thrive. And so we're like, okay, that's a really good thing. So how, how do we get Benita to thrive? What's needed in that? And so we were like, okay, so actually we need um, Benito's goals to be in a place where the whole team can see. We need a playbook that everybody can follow and everyone knows the standard behaviours that are expected. And we need to have quarterly reviews to help people push, people, push everyone forward. Um, and so then with that framework, we were then able to start thinking, okay, so what tools can we use to help us fulfill that? Um, and we've actually um, chosen one of the ones that I said earlier, um, although we haven't implemented yet because it was literally two weeks ago. Um, so by, but the important thing that I found with that is by following this process of why, how, what, you created a context for your process. You, you figured out um, uh, that you could follow this framework to understand what you're actually trying to achieve rather than just rushing to the latest cool thing um, I'd just like to ask. I just like to ask um, your timesheet process. Yes. Interesting. How does it work, and how much money have you saved since you started it? Um, that's a great question. How does it work? Is uh, we use a tool for tracking it. 
but we've also integrated that with other task management and project management tools. Um, and so when you're working on a task, you can actually click a little button and it starts tracking the time that you're working for on that task. Um, it's the simplest way of doing that. In terms of how much money have we saved from it, um, we've only recently done it probably within the past three or four months, so I'm not really sure how much money we've saved from it. What it does do is it provides us with great data. So we had a, a retrospective of a, a project yesterday, actually, and it was the first time when we were actually able to say, right, well, this is how much time we spent on it. This is how much time we've quoted for it. This is the difference. Okay, so why did this happen? Why was that? So while it might not have necessarily saved us any money, it's been great for that process to then start improvement and kind of building on top of that. Um, so I hope that, that helps. But did you build it yourself? No. We haven't built any of the tools that we use um, ourselves. They're all uh, third party ones which we've um, used. Mm -hmm. Hey, Mark. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, right. Finally, we have Matt and Mary from Halo Electronics, who are also on the breath. They've been nice. The lights. The lights. Yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this is really exciting. What we've got to show this is the first. Uh, don't know this. Anybody want to do their one minute pitch? Okay. Cool. We're just going to uh, do some text on some chat about what you're saying. I really want to do one Good evening. My name is Murray. This is Matt. And for the past six months, we've been working on a new product. <laughs> Uh, three months ago, we were lucky enough to be accepted into E4F, the startup incubator based here. And tonight, we're delighted to be showing you our new product to an audience for the very first time. But <laughs> 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 first, we're going to play a little game. And that game is called Which Device Took the Photo? What we're going to do is we're going to show you three photos, and by a show of hands, you're going to tell us. Uh, which of the photos was taken by a professional camera, a DSLR? Which of them was taken with a smartphone? And which of them was taken with a smartphone to camera? Okay? So here is photo one. So, hands up, who thinks this was taken with a professional camera? Okay? And hands up, who thinks it was taken with a smartphone? Alright. And who thinks it was taken with a point to shoot camera? Alright. I'll tell the answers in a minute. The first is photo two. Hands up. Who thinks it was taken with a professional camera? Hands up. Who thinks it was taken with a smartphone? And hands up. Who thinks it was taken with a point of view camera? All right. One final, one final photo up. Okay, so hands up for professional camera. Yeah. So you're changing minds a little now. Um, all right, so uh, hands up for a smartphone. And hands up for a point of sheet camera. Okay, well, I can now reveal that in fact, photos one, two, and three were all taken with a smartphone. Which, uh, I mean, that's, that's pretty incredible that a camera that is so tiny can take amazing pictures like this. Hang on a minute. <laughs> My photos never look like this. It's about yours. 
And there's actually going to be a reason for it. What you notice is all of these are all outdoors, and there's plenty of light. In actual fact, about 80% of your photos are taken in low light conditions. This is a statistic by Google. They found it through monitoring real world people. <laughs> so, what do you think is really good luck? Why is it like this? And so you get um, bright areas which are too bright. The subjects are actually want to light up is too dark. Um, and all the faces, they lose the colour. It's heavily affected by the ambient light colour. And in the worst case, if you get movement while you're taking your photo, then you lose all the colours all together and it becomes unsharp. This is called motion blur. So we looked at what the solutions might be. There's actually two solutions. The first is that you gather more of the available ambient light. And the way you do that is you have a big lens, and you have to put that on your smartphone, gathering more of the light. And that would look something like this. We decided that wasn't going to work. So we looked at the second solution, which is add more light to your photo. Now the professionals use equipment like this. So our challenge was to condense this equipment down into something that was powerful, portable, and that worked wirelessly with your smartphone. And the good news is, we managed it. <laughs> so we're now introducing the Halo. Right. Uh, <laughs> currently, the Halo is a prototype stage and looks like this. Uh, once it is complete and uh, is fully finalised, it will be just 8 millimetres thin and be about the size of a credit card. Uh, currently, it works uh, seamlessly uh, and you simply need your smartphone with a dedicated Halo app and you <laughs> point to your smartphone where you want to take a photo, point your halo where you want to take a photo, and then press the take picture button. Your halo communicates wirelessly with your smartphone, monitors the ambient lighting conditions, so the conditions around you, and provides the perfect amount of light for your photo, allowing you to create the best possible photo you possibly can on your smartphone. And that's something we're going to demonstrate a little bit later. But for now, you might be wondering, well, how bright is the halo? Well, if we compare it to other different light sources, which we've got along the bottom of this lovely chart, uh, and then we've got their brightness measured in lux along the side, we can see that existing iPhone flash is around 350 lux. The car headlights, typical car headlights, be about 7,000 lux. Typical daylight conditions, so similar to this room, that would be about 10,000 lux, whereas something like direct sunlight, that's a lot more. <coughs> You're looking at about 100,000 lux for that. So, how bright is the halo? Well, I'm pleased to announce that it is over 200,000 lux. <laughs> that's very bright. <laughs> the, the result is you get dramatically improved photos. So, if we have a look at one of the photos we saw earlier, this was taken with iPhone 6 in low light conditions. Uh, that's with the standard flash. And so if we take the same phone in the same conditions but use a halo flash, then the photo looks more like this. And uh, basically we have much, much higher contrast, much more realistic uh, colours, and of course, superior detailing. And when I say superior detailing, I really mean superior detailing. Uh, we can zoom in around 300% and crop the photo. And uh, that uh, the, the photo with the halo flash still retains most of the detail, whereas it's completely lost in the, uh, with the standard flash. And at this point, I'd like to thank our model, who probably doesn't realize <laughs> he's such a big part of our presentation. So, uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, but the halo isn't just about being incredibly bright. It's also about being incredibly fast. And that's something we're going to demonstrate now with 
and incredibly risky live demonstrations. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay. coughs> so for our live demo, what we're going to attempt to do is take a picture of Matt firing a pencil bubble. Now, the pencil bubble has already gone off is a bit boring, and the pencil bubble hasn't fired yet is a bit boring. So we're going to try and get a photo of the streamers flying through the air as it explodes. So to give you an idea of how fast this has to be, the first needs to go off one hundred five thousandths of a second after he pulls the party pop up. And we're going to try and do that in front of you. <laughs> <laughs> So, we have some technology magic now, where I believe if I push this button... <laughs> we should have. So this is the Halo app. <coughs> and what we're going to do, we're going to set Matt up. We just focus on him. Switch the halo on. And I've entered sound mode, so it now listens for a sound. Then all we have to do is fire the party popper in three, two. We're gonna get. We're gonna. Take some more because we're going to try and use these for marketing. <laughs> and the moment of truth. So if this works, oh, I'm impressed. <laughs> in April. And before then, we want to get more people testing this um, in, on whatever they want, taking pictures of events, and trying fun photos like this. And so we're actively looking for prototype testers. If that's something you think you might have fun with, you might like to have a go with a device like this, then please come see us after this presentation, and we'll sort you out with a halo, and we'd love to get your feedback on it. So thank you for listening. Impressive. <laughs> right, right. We've got any questions, guys? There's some questions for having a bit of a time. Did you have an Android app as well, or just on the Android? We're planning on building an Android app. Um, so we'll raise, we'll, we'll, we'll take it to possible at that point, which we're sure it is. <coughs> then while, once we have the, the cash from Kickstarter, we'll use that to develop the Android app. But yes, fully intended on building it for Android as well. Great, thanks. Did you have a question? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, so you have a great presentation, right? Awesome. Um, so, you've got a lot of your background experience. What would you like to do? What would you like to do? How do you end this? <laughs> so, I was a, a, a physics student, and then I'm an engineer by day, and a flash <laughs> builder by night. <laughs> 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 and uh, I'm an automotive engineer, and uh, by day, I sell headstones. So, <laughs> 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 yeah, thanks. Um, just a, a quick note. Uh, it would be really cool. Stop seeing the lights slowly right down. Just looking from just you know, from like, this one picture here. Um, obviously, it's always really cool to see how, how it works at all and all that conditions, but. Maybe for like future presentations, it would be great to see how that actually compares to just uh, a normal flash picture. I know you showed the graph there, but um, obviously I can just see the light in the background and it's just the light in the foreground, but just to just to show future presentations. To my mind's eye, if I saw that and said, oh, it's just taking a flash from the phone, forgive me, I would probably 
that is the So it would be a hard job as well as to do the function of each presentation as a condensed method. So thank you. Thanks for feedback. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, well, that's that's really fucking sick. That's really that's really really cool. Uh, I was amazed. Uh, I just I just really wanted to ask. So um, the actual flash is is very nice, but. Uh, when you go out on a night out, you don't say, wait, I just need to grab my flash. Uh, is there any plans to, to, to make Halo a, a bit less uh, too handy? Because you actually have to, hand, uh, to grab it with two hands. And so, yeah. so the idea, yeah, that's exactly something we've been wrestling with. The idea is that it won't be the size of a credit card, and it's very thin. So you'll keep it in your pocket, kind of on your phone. So. If you're in, in out, then you should be able to reach into your pocket and grab both of them together and hold them as one unit. Okay. I have a question. Is there any way you could combine it as a case? Because yeah. I would buy that as a case, like tomorrow. We'd love to get people's feedback from the, the prototype testers. It's something we've looked at. The, the only problem with the case is that it's, it's bound to one phone. Um, and to, to develop all the tooling and the moldings, and you have to invest it all in just one phone. If it's for the iPhone, it's, it's brilliant. Again, you do, you still use half the market because Android's gone, but it's, it's something we, we would look into. Definitely look into that because like, I would buy that on my phone as a case. Sorry, I might have jumped in there. Um, and you think about opening it to app developers or giving some sort of API so people can take it to hackathons and play with it and go crazy? Or is it just going to be your app? It's not that. <laughs> it's something I really like to do. So I'm a kind of self-taught programmer and I just try and work out how to make this work. And to do something like that is, is beyond what I'm capable of. But I mean, if it's something you, you know more about, I'd love to talk to you after this to work out how I might do something like that. Thanks. Uh, can we get on to the quiz time? <laughs> 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 uh, of course, yes. <laughs> <laughs> We'd love to have you soon. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Any more this time? Just not that I'm lazy. <laughs> Um, just to follow on from what we said before, um, I know you want to, you don't want to restrict yourself to certain parts of the market, but if you look at the spending behaviour of people who are in an iPhone compared to people who are in an Android phone, you'll see that you'll probably have a lot more on iPhone and you probably need to win costs. Um, please come talk to me as well because we also do um, electronics for phones, so um, I'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have if you're struggling with certain parts of that. And I can imagine it's probably the, the battery itself that does it because it's quite a, a thick piece. You said it's eight millimeters thick. Um, you don't want your case to be too thick. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lou. I'll you that. It's the, um, yeah, so one of the components is, it's actually the capacitor is the really thick bit. So that's what provides all the juice for the back. And it's, it's like a battery, but it can unleash the energy in a split second. And they're, they're quite thick, um, which is some, something we're trying to work out how to make them fit. Um, so you, you charge a capacitor. Um, you asked how, how does the capacitor work? How does it charge? There's a battery in the halo, and then the halo constantly charges the capacitor. It takes about four seconds to charge. Um, and then all that energy is unleashed in about a thousandth of a second, which is the flash. Can I just? No, it's, yeah. it's, 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 I'm recording. I'll just stop the microphone. So how much does the, the battery last? Um, the battery at the moment lasts for about 600 full power flashes, but a standard sort of flash is more like one to one and a half thousand. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> Just a question on um, where the focus is obviously you're quite close to him now. If you were going to take a photo from where you're standing now, obviously the light would have to travel further. So, does the app work out how, how 
uh, the distance needs to, to go. It does, so, um, so in the mode I've just showed you there, we are in full manual mode because we've preset the, the lighting. Um, but there is an auto mode which you would use on a, on a night out, for example. And the way that works is it fires one pre flash, so it's a little bit like a digital camera, fires one pre flash, it analyzes the lighting conditions from that, then it takes one photo without a flash, analyzes the lighting conditions from that, and then it knows how effective that flash has been. And then from that, it does all the maths and works out how, how powerful the flash needs to be, how bright the picture needs to be, and puts it all together, and then does your final image. And it'll do that in about a tenth of a second. <laughs> <laughs> so you still be able to get uh, one more here. Uh, how much do you intend to resell it for? It's the same we are still looking at, but somewhere between eighty-five and one hundred and twenty. It's, it's a big window at the moment. It's something we're going to work out as the things we move on. All right, thanks. Any more? Any more questions?